Welcome back to our study of 1 Corinthians. We're going to begin in chapter 6 on this lesson, continuing on. <clears throat> you know, as Paul has wrote in his letter to the church at Corinth, you can't help but notice that there is a heart problem in the church. Uh, the first four, actually five chapters that we've dealt with, he's dealt with all sorts of division. There's a problem of division and all sorts of immorality that's taken place in the church. Things that, that, as Paul wants these people to know, destroying the unity and the things that are going on are just not characteristics that should be seen in God's church. God's body. So now as we begin chapter 6, Paul has to deal with yet another shocking situation that uh, is in the Corinthian church. And as we've seen, as I said in our study of, of Corinthians so far, all of the fighting and the arguing and the dividing and all of the divisions over all of the issues, <clears throat> the glorying in the wrong things, uh, unrepentant sins and the unwillingness to deal with it uh, there's a t to me it's an even if not as bad even to me it's even more appalling that you would see this sort of a attitude between brothers and sisters in Christ let's look at verse 1 and look at the issue Chapter 6, verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? So Paul reveals that here we have the church at Corinth, these Christians, and they're going to court over grievances between each other. Uh, to me, that begins to show us, or shows me anyway, the real dysfunction of this group who call themselves Christians. They're fighting and they're dividing over things. And now, uh, because they have disputes and grievances with other Christians, they're taking each other to court. And you'll notice to me the astonishment that Paul has when he says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous before, and, and not before the saints? I mean, <clears throat> Paul is addressing, if you will, again, to me, uh, a lack of love, and I am amazed at their attitude toward one another. Christians having a dispute in such a way that they're not only going to court with each other, but they're taking it, if you will, to someone who is outside of the body, who would have a totally different concept of how to deal with things. They would deal with it in a worldly way, not in a, in a godly way or with godly wisdom. Uh, whenever we deal with each other, we need to use spiritual wisdom and have spiritual values. And how logical is it to, to take a dispute that we have between two people and to take it before the court system in this world and say, you figure it out. Look in verse 2. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you, know not, do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? So here we, are, we see, as, and I, I'm amazed, he, sa he says, we're supposed to be people with a spiritual mind and spiritual wisdom and can't you work out your earthly differences between yourself and and Paul makes this argument he says Christians are going to be the ones to judge the world and Christians will judge angels and and don't get hung up on that uh, I'll talk about that here a little bit more in a moment but so many people tend to get hung up with that but Paul is making a statement or an argument that has to deal with from the greater to the lesser. And he says, how can it be that you're not competent enough, competent enough to make judgments regarding the small things on this earth? 
How is it that you can't be competent enough to judge things on this earth whenever you're in light of what you're going to judge in the future? You're going to judge the world. You're going to judge angels. You have a greater responsibility in judgment coming. And we need to be able to apply godly principles and godly wisdom and godly knowledge and spiritual values to our judgments. That's what Paul wants them to understand. Look at the things that, that are out here before you now in this world. They're, they're minuscule. They're, there's nothing in compare to what's coming in judgment for the world and for angels. Now, like I say, many people stumble here in, in this judging of the world and judging of angels and to a degree that if we're not careful, we lose the message that Paul is, is sending. And I don't want us to lose sight of the point that Paul is making because the purpose of the argument is that we understand it's the judging of the greater and the lesser, down to the lesser. But, but just, I know the question's on your mind, so let's answer the question about angels and, and the world and, and what Paul is talking about. And I'll do my best to, to address this. I do not believe that the point that Paul is making is that we're going to sit as judgments on the day of judgment, or we're going to sit as judges on the day of judgment. We're not going to sit there and sit there and watch all of the angels and all of those who are of the world be judged, and we're going to give our thumbs up or thumbs down. I don't see that. That's not in Scripture. They're not going to parade the angels and the wicked before us, and, and we're going to say yes or no. That's not what I see. But I do see in scriptures a picture of us reigning with Christ and sharing in the rule and the reign with him. If you hold your place here and go to 2 Timothy chapter 11. 2 Timothy chapter 11. <clears throat> I'm sorry, chapter 2. I'll get it right here in a minute. Chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Paul writes to Timothy, and in verse 11 he says, This is a faithful saying, For if we died with him, we shall also live with him, speaking of Jesus. And if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So here's this picture in the New Testament of us reigning with him if we endure. So we're reigning with Christ. Now, that being said, go, if you would, over to Daniel chapter 7. There's a picture of this also in Daniel chapter 7. <clears throat> verse, uh, yes, Daniel chapter 7, verse 27. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 7, verse 27, we read, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. The kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So here we have a picture of the people, the saints of the Most High. Again, the kingdom is given over to, to him to reign, and he, he's going to reign forever, but the kingdom is given over, and here we are. The picture is we're reigning with him. So, as Christians, as children of God, as fellow heirs with Christ, we get to join, I don't know if corporately is the word I want to use, but we get to, we get to join in in the rule and the lordship and, and watching as Jesus is lord over creation and as he, he is, is taking care of all of the judgment and everything and we get to sit alongside with him in that. So Paul is, is bringing this out that says, you're going to reign with him. And if you're going to reign with him, you're going to have the mind of Jesus. And you're going to have the, the ability to sit there and judge right from wrong, the good from the evil, the things that are good, the things that are bad. You're going to have this ability. You have this ability. So we share in that lordship. We share in that reign. So... Back in Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5, <clears throat> Paul brings this issue to them. He says, I say this to your shame. It is 
so that there is not is it so that there is not a wise man among you not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren so here is Paul and, and as he's saying he says you ought to be able to deal with this yourself but he says is there not at least one wise person with some spiritual integrity and some wisdom and spiritual knowledge that could judge between you and not take it to the courts in the world isn't there somebody there? Verse 6. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. You take it to the world. Instead of dealing with the things that they're, they're going on within their, their body, they're taking each other to court. And, you know, it's amazing to me how many people in the world today are just as guilty of this. I've seen it. He says... It's deplorable. He says, can't you settle your differences between yourselves? And he says, if you can't, can't you at least find somebody spiritual among you to work it out? Now, had Paul stopped right there, period, and gave them direction, he's, and he's given, given them direction, he says, so here, find somebody within the body to deal with it. Why are you going to the world? Why are you going outside of the body of Christ? Why are you going to the world to settle your disputes that, that are taking place between you? Why are you looking for worldly wisdom? I think it's important to notice that Paul doesn't just leave the situation there. He doesn't merely just put a period, end of, this, end of discussion, work it out between yourselves, have somebody figure it out, judge between yourselves, problem solved. <clears throat> That would be the end of the matter. But Paul goes even deeper and digs even deeper into the heart of the issue. And the problem is there's a heart problem again. The problem is they're taking each other to court to begin with. Verse 7. <clears throat> now therefore it is already an utter failure that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Or why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Paul says it is an utter failure for you that you're going to law with one another. The New American Standard, I'm reading from the New King James, the New American Standard says it's a defeat for you. And the word that is used here, the Greek word that is used for defeat or failure, it is a term that's used, and it's a court-type term, and the point is, is you might win your case in court in the world, but you've lost your case in the court of God because you're going to court with your brother. You may go out here and you may win the court case, but in God's eyes, you've already defeated yourself. You're an utter failure. <clears throat> The Christian life, and so many people miss this point, the Christian life is not about winning. It's not about being right or being vindicated here on earth. It's not about getting personal justice. The Christian life, the life that we live is about being right in God's eyes. And I said that to say this, you can win your case in court and still be an utter failure in the sight of God think about that Paul declares they have suffered defeat their failures because they've chose to handle their conflicts by taking each other to court and he says is that who we've really become and if it is then we failed verse 7 again <clears throat> picking up he says now therefore it is already an utter failure that you go to law against one another why not rather accept wrong why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated Paul says how should you handle conflict well it's re real easy he says Paul says why not just suffer the wrong why not let yourself be defrauded it's far better financially that that you lose a little money or that you be cheated financially or you be treated wrong and suffer some sort of injustice than to lose out spiritually eternally. That's what Paul is telling them. 
And I think that's an important principle that as Christians today we need to consider. What is right in the world's eyes is not necessarily right in the eyes of God. And just because I'm right doesn't mean that I have to prove that I'm right. I've learned to be content to know that I'm right, but if, if that's what they want to believe, if that's what they want to do, if that's how they want to treat me, okay. It's okay. God will take care of it. If I've been cheated, God will take care of it. He'll take care of me. He'll take care of the problem eventually. If I've been defrauded, God will take care of me. He'll take care of the problem eventually. Why not just experience and take the injustice? It's sad, but so many people, that it's, they, they feel it's so important that they win, that they're vindicated, that they get their justice, their day in court, and that they're proved right. <clears throat> now consider this. Remember, we're talking about brother to brother and sister. And he says, why not just let them win? Do we have to be right all the time? You ever see those people who've got to have the last word? They've got to be right. Okay. Now, I said that to say this. I think, and this is Mike speaking, but I, I think I can say this without hesitation. I think it's important that if two people who call themselves Christians are really changed people, and they profess to be loving Christian people who love God and they love their brothers and they're behaving as Christians that neither one of them would want to do wrong or treat the other one in a way that the other one suffers wrong. I hope that made sense. Example, if I'm a Christian and I've caused you or somebody else to suffer some sort of financial loss or some injustice, I want that person to feel like they could come to me and say, you done me wrong or you, you that's not right and and I would say I am so sorry and let me make it right now let me make it right let me do what I can to make it right I would not want to defame or defraud or do wrong to anybody and I would hope that we're all that way similarly I would hope that the person that I did it to would also be of that mind and attitude, and maybe it happens to me, and I sit there and I go, but that's okay, don't worry about it. We have that attitude that says, it's okay. I, you know, you cheated me out of $5, it's okay. I didn't mean to, here's $5, no, that's okay, I, I, it's okay. That we can work things out, and that's just an example, but, but why not just be willing to suffer the wrong? And why not have the attitude that says, if I did wrong, I wanna make sure that I treat you right that we don't take advantage of one another. And you know, the sad thing is, in the body of our Lord, sometimes I see so often, our brothers and sisters are sometimes the ones that we abuse the most. And that's sad. It's sad. But we learn this principle with Jesus. Jesus is the one who sacrificed himself totally. He gave himself totally and suffered the loss, even his life, and not just his life, but the way that he lost his life, the way that he suffered and died and, and went through everything that he went through so I can gain, and he's willing to forgive me. Jesus gives us that example. Can't we have that same kind of thinking? I am quite certain that divisions in, in the body of the Lord would come to an end and they would stop abruptly if people would learn to think more like that. <clears throat> and if we're not careful and we're not willing to think like, like that, we can forfeit our rights to heaven. That's the sad reality of it all. Paul says it's a defeat for you. You're an utter failure. To me, that's pretty strong language and something we need to take attention to. Verse 8 takes it even a step farther, and I'm appalled when I read it. He says, do, now, now you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brother. And he says, you're worried about your rights, and he says, you turn around and you do it to your brethren too. I'm amazed. 
How many people are concerned about their own rights and getting ahead at, the, at any cost? I want to go ahead real quick and go through verses 9 through 11. We're going to pick up that uh, through 9 through 11 on the next lesson, but I want, to, I want to get through this real quick. Beginning in verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. <clears throat> Paul is drawing to the end of chapter six or in the middle he's getting ready he's he's setting up in verses 9 through 11 he's setting up if you will uh, something that kind of ties what he's talked about in the beginning of chapter six and he says don't you know he's he's ending that argument and he's getting ready to bring it right into another argument about sexual immorality and it's kind of interesting how he ties it all together in these three verses and he says, you go to law against one another, and he says, you, you cheat each other. And he says, don't you realize, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And he gives a list here. He says, don't be deceived. And he says, don't you know this? And he's, he gives a list, and it's a pretty significant list, and it's pretty easy to understand these things, but we're going to talk about that more in the next lesson. He, he kind of says... <clears throat> Don't you realize that you're deceiving yourselves and thinking that, that you're okay with the Lord whenever you see all of these things? And the list that's here, I, I say this because if you look at this list and there's any of this that's going on in your life, it tells me and it tells you that maybe we need to make a change in our life if this is who we are, if there's any of this going on. And he says, and that's not who you were. Or that's who you were, but that's not who you are. He says, don't you realize that none of these people, none of these actions are going to make it to heaven? They're, they're not going to see the kingdom. And such were some of you, verse 11. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. As Christians, we have a responsibility to live in harmony with one another and to live in, in righteousness and holiness with God. That's, that's our responsibility. That's who we're supposed to be. And we need to learn to think in terms of our family. You hear people a lot of times talk about their church family. And I guess that's true in a way. We are a family. We're a body. But can you ever think or imagine what it would be like if your left hand was fighting your right hand all the time for dominion? Your left hand or your right hand wouldn't intentionally do something to hurt the other one, would it? Why would we do that within the body? First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul put, put it out there. I think it needs to be repeated. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That was Paul's prayer for the church. That's God's desire for the body. And that's my hope and my prayer for us, is that we strive and, and earnestly contend to live a life that looks to Jesus and looks to live in a way that we love and treat each other with respect and how we look toward each other to, to better each other, to help each other to do better in, in our walk with the Lord, not to be in contentions with each other. We'll continue to examine verses 9 through 11 in our next study.